Those of you that were here for the first panel, thank you so much for participating. And you know, it's tough when I run around with that microphone because I could have actually had many, many more of you talk. So, so please feel free also to participate in this panel discussion as well. It's really my privilege um, to introduce the convener of this panel, um, who I like to refer to as my mentor at the NYU Silver School of Social Work. She is somebody that I've admired before I got to Silver for her commitment to homeless adults and adults who struggle with a host of poverty-related challenges and many times are also burdened with challenges around substance use and, and mental health issues. And, 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 and what I have always admired about Deborah Paget's work is that she treated her participants as collaborators. She created studies that gave people voice about their lived experience. And, and her team really, I think, is defined by their respect for all people, and if particularly people that have uh, experienced such adversity. And, and so she's going to moderate our panel today. I learn a lot from her. She is also a McSilver faculty affiliate, and it's my privilege to call her my colleague and my friend. So thank you, Deborah. Hi, hi, hi. Thank you very much, Mary. That is humbling, to say the least. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second session of today's um, McSilver Awards and Symposia. Uh, we're going to continue the theme today with our speakers of taking research and translating it into action. By that, I want to say, I just want to first introduce that I am an anthropologist and I am a social work researcher uh, at NYU. I am interested in homelessness and particularly in the effects of housing on people's lives. It's something we take for granted so often that we have a place to live and a shelter. But having spent the last 10 years studying people who were formerly homeless and then came indoors and found a home uh, has been uh, transformative for me and my research team and my colleagues. Um, some of you may know I've been doing research on Housing First, which is the model that started here in New York City. Uh, I have been traveling internationally the past year and I'm stunned by how much Housing First has come into the public discourse in Europe, in Canada, and Australia. Um, I would like to ask you a question starting out today. How many of you know an evidence-based practice that also endorses a fundamental human right? That is Housing First. Housing First has the evidence and it also starts from a premise that people are entitled to a place to live and then receive the services they need to stay housed. It started in New York in 1992, and, uh, and from there it has been spreading, and I'm writing a book about that now. I'm immersed in thinking about all of these reasons why certain innovations catch on and spread and others don't. But traveling around, I've seen that it's called in Europe a juggernaut. I don't think I would say it's that way in New York City, but we'll get to there. Um, but I just want to say that I, some part of me thinks as I travel that only in New York City could Housing First have been invented and started. And the reason why I say that is because when I travel to Sweden and other places, I see very organized social systems, service systems. And our system is so fragmented that I think it left room for someone like Sam Zimbaris to say, wait a minute, I think I'm going to do something different here and give people housing first and then provide the services. So that's probably a, an empirical question, but I do, I do have doubts that anywhere else it could have started. The alternative to housing force first is the staircase approach. That is, individuals start with shelters, work up through transitional housing, and through good behavior, they gradually work up to getting their own apartment. So housing first has reversed that, and that I thank Mary so much for uh, giving me some credit for being involved in this. It's, it's, a, it's a source of passion for me. I've never found research more satisfying to do in my life. So today, we have a superb panel of speakers from various positions within homeless services. We have advocates, we have providers, we have researchers. Some people are occupying more than one of those roles. Um, so I'm going to introduce each speaker, and uh, each individual will take about 10 minutes. And we want to leave plenty of time for Q&A from the floor. So we'll be fairly strict on the uh, timekeeping. And if you would keep your questions to the end, I think that's the best way to go. And I'll be taking notes and 
um, trying to, to sum up a little bit as we move along. So the first speaker today I'm pleased to note is Patrick Marquis. He's a senior policy analyst, director of advocacy for the Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, Mr. Marquis has offered numerous research policy papers, briefs, articles in the media on affordable housing and homeless studies in New York City. So I'm going to turn it over to Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you everybody and thank you to, uh, to the McSilver Institute for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, I'm just going to say a quick word about Coalition for the Homeless for those of you who don't know us. We're best known as an advocacy group, uh, an advocacy and public policy organization. Um, we were uh, incorporated in 1981, um, but our co-founders were working together in the late 1970s when modern homelessness emerged in New York City and in, in the United States uh, as the problem that it has become today. Um, we were co-founded by a lawyer, an anthropologist, and a social worker, so very much, uh, I think, in the spirit of folks working on the front lines, and uh, became best known for our early legal victories, including uh, landmark a uh, lawsuit called Callahan v. Carey that established a legal right to shelter for homeless men, a, a legal right that was then later extended to homeless women and to homeless families with children. Uh, we also uh, brought litigation in the 80s that secured the right to vote for homeless people, uh, protections for homeless people living with mental illness and HIV and AIDS, um, for children in foster care, uh, other legal victories, and then uh, we went on as well to, uh, in recent years, to focus as much on our litigation as on as much on, uh, on sort of campaigns, advocacy campaigns, fighting for real solutions to the problem of homelessness as much as litigation. But in addition to that, we also operate 11 direct services programs that help more than 3,000 homeless and low-income people uh, in New York each day, and that includes feeding people on the streets every night of the year, a summer camp for homeless children, uh, job training programs, for permanent housing programs, eviction prevention services, so I think we're unique as an advocacy group in the sense that we actually see the problem firsthand every day. Every day when I go to the office, I'm not just sort of crunching numbers behind a computer, although I do that too. Um, but I'm, I'm also working with folks who are experiencing homelessness and hearing firsthand kind of what's happening, uh, happening on the front lines. Uh, so where are we right now in terms of homelessness in New York? Well, simply put, we are experiencing uh, a historic crisis of homelessness. Uh, in New York City. There are now more homeless people in New York than at any time since the Great Depression in the 1930s. Uh, we have more than 53,000 homeless New Yorkers sleeping each night in our shelter system. That includes more than 22,000 children. Uh, since the former mayor, Bloomberg, uh, took office in 2002, we've seen a 75% increase uh, in our homeless shelter population. We've seen an 85% increase in the number of homeless families. Homeless families make up 80% of our shelter population, uh, very much cutting against the stereotype that I think the general public has about who's homeless. Um, it's families and kids uh, who make up the majority of the homeless population in New York. In addition to that 53,000 people who are in our municipal shelter system each night, we have thousands of folks who are sleeping on the streets and in other public spaces, unsheltered. Uh, we have an additional 5,000 people sleeping in other shelter systems operated by city government and also in, uh, in private shelters or faith-based shelters. So uh, it's a population well over 60,000 people a night uh, in New York City. So again, the, the, the highest population of homeless people uh, since the city began keeping records uh, and the, the largest homeless population since the Great Depression. <coughs> <clears throat> to put it another way, I mean, we can sort of measure homelessness kind of on a nightly basis, but we can also look at it in terms of how many people experience this homelessness over the course of a year. More than 110,000 different New Yorkers actually utilize the homeless shelter system each year, and that includes more than 40,000 children. So just dramatic numbers of, of folks uh, experiencing homelessness. So uh, how have we gotten into this, uh, how have we gotten into this worsening crisis? Well. There's the deeper historical roots, and I'll just say a, sort of a few uh, words about that, and that would be the subject of kind of you know a longer panel and multiple uh, discussions. But then there's the sort of the more recent uh, policy mistakes that were made, uh, particularly under the last mayoral administration, and then the sort of the problem of housing affordability. But if we look sort of back into the kind of the deeper roots of the problem, we know that modern homelessness uh, in the United States and in New York very much emerged uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, 
in large part as a result of changes in housing affordability and changes in housing markets, the sort of widening gap between incomes and housing costs that we've seen across the country, um, but also in the decision by government, particularly uh, the Reagan administration's dramatic uh, cutbacks in federal housing programs. Um, I would just ask a question to folks, I'm borrowing this from a colleague of mine. How many people here have ever received uh, federal housing assistance? You just raise your hands. How many people here have ever owned their own home or you know, grew up with a family that owned their own home? So you all have received the largest amount of federal housing assistance that's actually available. Uh, 90 to 100 billion dollars a year that's provided to homeowners uh, as a tax deduction for mortgage interest payments, right? So that's the largest, that's the largest amount that the federal government pays to support housing and it mostly goes to middle class and upper income people. Um, in comparison, the, the budget for the federal housing agency for housing programs for low income people is about 40 billion dollars. So we pay, we, we as taxpayers spend more on subsidizing the housing of middle income and upper income folks than we do on subsidizing the housing of low income folks. So that, that sort of mismatch became even worse in, during the Reagan administration. We really never recovered from that. At the same time, we saw changes in state and city policies uh, here in New York uh, that have made housing less affordable to New Yorkers. Interesting because New York State and New York City had a very proud and uh, very progressive tradition of, of providing uh, housing assistance in a way that where the federal government wasn't sort of meeting the, meeting the needs and also in preserving affordable housing through our very strong rent regulation system that we had coming out of the Second World War, uh, through public housing, not all of it federal, but the, the first public housing in the United States was built right here in, in uh, New York City, uh, through other programs like the mitchell Lama program, which was a state affordable housing program, through a host of programs that really made a difference in providing affordable housing for working class and low-income New Yorkers. We saw all of that really begin to diminish and get taken away through the 80s and 90s. Uh, that brings us, again, in very schematic fashion to kind of where we are now. What have we seen in recent years? Well, what has led us to this crisis, a 75% increase in the homeless shelter population just in the last, uh, last 12 years? Well, number one, worsening housing affordability. Um, according to the Census Bureau, since the economic crisis in 2008, we saw median rents in the city increase by 8.5%, while we saw renter incomes go down by almost 7%. So just a widening of that gap between the cost of housing and what people are earning. Uh, secondly, disastrous policy mistakes by the last administration. Uh, the Bloomberg administration decided to break with more than 20 years of uh, a successful homeless policy by essentially taking away permanent housing resources that had been targeted to help homeless children and families leave shelters and get into uh, permanent housing. Uh, so previous mayors, Koch, Dinkins, Giuliani, even Bloomberg in his first term, mayors of both political parties, had decided that they would allocate a certain number of our federal housing programs, our scarce federal housing resources, including public housing and rental vouchers, to help homeless families leave shelter, move into permanent housing, a program that worked incredibly successfully, helped more than 50,000 uh, homeless families, tens of thousands of homeless children move out of shelters into their own homes. The city also, through its housing development programs, would allocate certain numbers of apartments for homeless families. Mayor Koch's amazing 10-year housing plan, Housing New York, uh, created or preserved 150,000 apartments over 10 years, 15,000 of them, 10% of them were allocated to the homeless. So approaches that really worked under previous mayors were essentially taken away by the last administration. Uh, and that very much brought us to the crisis that we're at now. So just in closing, um, I've got the timekeepers already giving me the, giving me the, uh, the eye. Um, no, I'm just kidding. The, uh, let me just say where we're at now. We're at a very interesting moment, I think, in terms of advocacy and public policy. We're, there's a, very much a consensus about what works uh, to solve the problem of homelessness. I mean, that's the good news, is that we've learned, um, particularly here in New York, that affordable housing assistance targeted to homeless families and children helps them escape homelessness and stay out of homelessness. The permanent supportive housing, which is a combination of housing with support services for homeless people living with disabilities and with mental illness and other special needs, like how the Housing First approach 
that that works to reduce homelessness and save taxpayer money. We know that that works. The good news is that our new mayoral administration, the de Blasio administration, has embraced that consensus in a way that the last administration did not. Uh, they've essentially said, we know that there are solutions here and we need to begin to put them in place to implement those housing-based solutions to solve this problem. Uh, they've laid out a framework that would involve creating new rent subsidy programs negotiated with the state. Those negotiations are going on now and we're very anxious to see how that turns out. Um, the mayor has committed to restoring priority use of public housing resources to help homeless families. Uh, we're anxious to see what the, the sort of the quantity of those resources is going to be. Is it going to be big enough to meet the needs that are there? Um, other approaches that we know work and that the new administration has embraced. And they've also begun to work with service providers, with advocates, with folks on the front lines to take away some of the punitive policies that we saw developed not only under the Bloomberg administration but under the Giuliani administration where we've had 20 years of an approach to homelessness that was really about kind of blaming homeless people for their homelessness instead of, in, instead of embracing the solutions that work. So a very interesting and very exciting moment to be doing this work. Thank you. Our next speaker is Reverend Heidi Newmark, uh, who's the executive director of Trinity Place and a pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Upper Manhattan. Reverend Newmark is one of the founders and the executive director of Trinity Place Shelter for Homeless LGBTQ Youth. And I'll turn it over to Heidi. And I'll give you my microphone. Thank you. Um, I'm very honored to be here among all these <laughs> smart people. Um, I, in terms of stereotypes of, of homeless people, I think if we asked uh, 100 New Yorkers to describe a homeless person they've seen in the past week, uh, none of them would describe uh, one of the usually well put together young people um, who are in our shelter and who are homeless. And yet in our city there is counted eight to 10,000 homeless queer youth, uh, probably more. And the really incredible statistic is that there are less than 200 shelter beds dedicated to that population. And the reason that matters is that shelters for the general homeless population are just not safe places for these young people. We've had, I've heard stories of youth who've been urinated on while they slept and with no intervention or advocacy from staff. And then there's like a stream of, of hostile and abusive comments that are common um, from other shelter residents and also at times from staff. So for a young person who's already been rejected and often known physical and emotional abuse t because of their sexual orientation or gender identification to go into a shelter where this is continuing hardly feels like an improvement and if anything it, it imperils their ability to move forward with their lives. And <laughs> transgender young people um, are often targets of even more brutal discrimination in such shelters. It's also true that these homeless young people are still at a very formative and vulnerable point in their lives and the right combination of, of safety stability and intensive support services can really enable them to exit homelessness permanently. So it seems like a population where some, you know, much more attention could make a permanent difference. Um, and that's why we opened the shelter. It's a non-sectarian shelter, but it is housed in the church. And that's, um, that's because myself, I saw that Sadly, religious institutions, ha um, not all of course, um, have had a key role in leading to families rejecting their queer youth. And so I believed as a leader of a religious institution that those of us with a different perspective have a responsibility to, to step up and do something. Um, and there was a core group of others, including we were really fortunate in our church to have a phenomenal social worker, whom some of you know, Kevin Lotz who worked tirelessly to get off the ground what we call the little shelter that, that could. And as of June 12th, we'll be running for um, eight years, or 2,920 nights. <laughs> <laughs> Where do they come from? The youth in our shelter come from around the country and even around the world. Uh, but when it's around the country, they're disproportionately from the South. Um, most have been rejected by their families and arrived in New York City uh, hoping to find 
um, more acceptance um, and a new life, but often find themselves um, on the street. Of course, um, affordability in New York is, is a big, is a huge um, barrier, and on the street with all kinds of um, unhealthy issues there. But many of these young people come from our own city. Um, a number of them are young people who've aged out of foster care. Um, most of them have been rejected by our fellow New Yorkers and are disproportionately, not surprisingly, youth of color and who come from backgrounds of poverty. So they have, um, they're dealing with racism, they're dealing with poverty, and they're dealing with uh, prejudice because of their sexual orientation or gender identification. Um, that's not the whole population. I mean, I can think of one transgender woman from one of the richest um, towns in Connecticut whose mother is a social worker, um, but could not accept that her child is transgender. I mentioned that our city has 200 beds, which in itself seems really small, dedicated to this population. But I didn't add that the majority of those beds are emergency beds, where you can only stay for 30 days or less. I mean, 30 days after a lifetime of suffering, you know, it, it's nothing almost. I mean, I won't say it's nothing, but it's not enough. And less than 40 of those 200 beds are transitional shelters, where you can stay more than 30 days. Our shelter, um, you can stay 18 months, um, and it's for young people age 18 to 24. So we provide uh, a, safe, a safe place to sleep, to store belongings. We provide meals, laundry money, metro cards, um, individual and group counseling. We have collaborations with other institutions, so our youth get medical care, psychiatric care, pro bono legal services. Um, we even have a dental hygienist who comes in on site and cleans teeth. <laughs> we have a well-known chef who comes and gives um, healthy cooking lessons because a lot of these life skills the young people need, need to learn. Um, we have an intake process and when a young person comes, they sit down with one of our social workers, the head one who's here, Wendy Kaplan, and um, they, the social workers help them delineate their goals. We have uh, 10 youth at a time, which is what we can legally have in terms of our church. And we have six part-time social workers, all of them who are licensed and overqualified. But I like to think that these young people who have gotten the worst are getting the best. Um, during the day, we expect our residents and help them to um, go to school, look for work, look f get um, often starting with an internship to build up a resume. Um, we help. Some of them need to go to high school or get a GED. Some of them are applying to college or going to college or job trainings. Um, while they're at the shelter, we have expectations that include um, sharing chores and weekly house meetings to learn kind of problem solving and conflict management, which are honed around issues like 10 young people sharing two showers, um, or who put the dirty pot in the refrigerator instead of washing it. But it's a time to learn how to negotiate those things and also to talk about more serious issues of um, rejection, anger, and depression. Um, because we're a small shelter, we also try to provide a kind of um, home loving and supportive family atmosphere that many have missed. So we celebrate holidays, birthdays, spa nights, <laughs> game nights, um, and lots of special occasions. Um, oh, what I wanted to say about the um, the, the, time, the 18 months is important um, because really transitioning from what they've known to be, being able to live in housing you know, takes time. Um, many of the youth have been living on the street just trying to get by day by day and so to go to a shelter where it's also all about day-to-day -day survival um, it doesn't provide a space to really grow and so I've seen that when they come to a place where they can kind of take a breath, um, some tough emer emotional issues that have just been tapped down start to emerge. And it's just not helpful to just say, well, tap that down because you've got to do this. Yeah, I mean, it takes time to work on those things. Um, and we've also seen bright, gifted, um, prepared young people rejected and fired, which is legal because they are transgender um, and, or because 
because of their sexual orientation. It takes a huge amount of energy um, to be just fighting off the daily negativity and abuse for the transgender young people. And then to even find more energy to take positive steps um, takes extra time and extra support because you're even, it's hard enough to find a job and then you're being discriminated against for yet one more reason. So it takes more time. I said we're celebrating our eight year anniversary. And I say celebrating with ambivalence um, because the fact that these shelters are needed is of course nothing to celebrate. Um, it is something to celebrate the amazing social workers that we've had and, uh, and the courage and resilience um, of the young people in the shelter is something to celebrate. I, I, I could tell, of course, as we, anybody working in this field could tell many stories, but just one, uh, we had one young woman who is from a Mormon community in Utah who's transgender, and we have a piano, and one night she came in and she was playing the piano, and I was there and I went over and it was really lovely, and I told her and she said, um, this is the only place I feel human. And I think her words are there to remind um, all of us how much this work matters, and also to remind us how much more there is to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, when now we move to yet another vulnerable population of veterans. Um, You've probably heard a lot in the news of, of late. So you're going to answer all of our questions, I know about it. <laughs> our next speaker is Julie Irwin uh, with the Net Network Homeless Care Manager for the Department of Veterans Affairs in New York, New Jersey Health Care Network. Julie chairs the New York City Continuum of Care Veterans Task Force, established to end veterans' homelessness by the end of 2015. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. It's really an honor and a privilege to be here on this panel today. And I actually had a really hard time kind of pulling um, my remarks together because um, despite uh, what you may believe uh, seeing the news, we have a lot of really interesting and exciting things going on for homeless veterans uh, in the VA. So um, what I'm gonna kind of highlight are some key policy and practice approaches that have been driving our efforts to end veteran homelessness, both nationally and locally. Um, and I just want to make a note that um, most of what I'm going to talk about relates to the Veterans Health Administration. The VA actually has three sub-agencies under its umbrella, the Veterans Benefits Administration, which is the you know, compensation and pension and GI Bill, home loan, those kinds of things. Uh, the healthcare system is what I think you probably are most familiar with, the hospitals, the outpatient clinics around the country. And then the third part of the VA, which is actually the smallest, is the National Cemetery Administration. So we work very closely with our, our sister uh, components, agencies in the VA, um, but I work for the Health Care Administration, and so I'm gonna focus mostly on uh, that part of the VA. So just in terms of brief history, um, VA homeless programs are not new. They actually started in 1988, and uh, one of the first homeless drop-in programs was here in Brooklyn um, by the Navy Yard. Um, that was a, a drop-in program, and it had a sister program in St. Albans, which was a residential psychosocial rehabilitation program for homeless veterans called the Domiciliary, which is still up and uh, doing well. And our earliest programs really focused a lot on outreach and on treating the reasons veterans became homeless. So we paid a lot of attention to mental health issues, substance abuse problems, medical issues, and the like. Um, and over time, our continuum of specialized homeless programs grew to fill different gaps and needs that, that came up over time. So, you know, over, over a 20 year period, we developed um, transitional housing, uh, which is a program called Grant Per Diem. We developed a dental program for homeless veterans that were in residential care. Um, one of my first jobs in the VA was um, as a social security liaison, which was a, a pilot initiative to get expedited disability benefits for homeless veterans um, that 
worked pretty well. Um, and then we've also had other, um, what at the time were uh, certainly cutting edge and innovative programs for women veterans who are homeless and for veterans who are chronically homeless. So 10 to 15 years ago, the majority of homeless veterans that we saw in the VA were either Vietnam era, mostly Vietnam era, and uh, post-Vietnam era. Here in New York City, then, the average age of homeless veterans was about 49 years old, and the vast majority were male minority members. They came to us with multiple complicated psychosocial factors that led to their homelessness, but by and large, those problems uh, were uh, mainly mental health issues, substance abuse, and, and medically disabling conditions, as I've mentioned. And looking back, there was no question that we were committed to the population and ensuring that they got the treatment that they needed to get their lives back on track so that they could get housed and be independent and move on. And I'll add that most of the housing resources we had for homeless veterans at the time, um, uh, what was available usually had sobriety and psychiatric stability requirements. So um, using housing as kind of a carrot um, was one way that we were able to work with veterans on addressing their treatment needs. But things began to change about six or seven years ago, particularly as veterans from the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts started to come home. And it seemed like there were more and more stories in the media. I know we're never in the media, but you know, there are more and more stories in the media about veterans becoming homeless and more attention and concern to growing numbers of homeless veterans. But frankly, it was really a hard problem to define because we didn't have consistent data. Um, even finding out who is a veteran could be problematic because the way questions were asked um, could elicit different answers depending upon who was asking and how and how it was being interpreted on the other end. So for example, even asking, are you a veteran, could be interpreted very differently by different people. Some People who had served in the military thought they weren't veterans unless they saw combat. And for women veterans, it was a um, particularly um, <coughs> difficult question because for them, the term veteran had kind of a male connotation. Oh, there's that five minute sign. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we learned quickly to ask the question, did you serve in the military? Um, and at the time, the estimates of homeless veterans varied widely, anywhere from 15 to 33 percent. But it was clear that relative to the general homeless population, veterans were overrepresented, and being a veteran was a risk factor for homelessness. The real game changer for us came in 2010, when for the first time, President Obama announced a commitment to ending veteran homelessness. And our secretary, Eric Shinseki, laid out a five-year plan to get to the goal of zero homeless veterans. The original plan had six strategic pillars for ending veteran homelessness, which included outreach, prevention, treatment, housing and supportive services, employment and education, and community partnerships. And all of this was consistent with the federal strategic plan to end homelessness. That plan is called Opening Doors. And it set deadlines for ending chronic homelessness and veteran homelessness by the end of 2015. And it's also important to note that the Secretary's plan included all veterans, not just the ones who are eligible for VA health care. So at the time, it was estimated that about 131,000 veterans were homeless on any given night nationally. And Secretary Donovan of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, in some of his comments at the time, talked about one out of every six homeless people in shelter um, having served in the military. So quite high numbers. But since then, we've seen a 25% decrease nationally in homelessness among veterans. And similarly, here in New York City, we've also seen a 25% decrease with even larger decreases in the number of street homeless veterans. What's interesting to me is that the demographic profile for the majority of homeless veterans hasn't really changed that much. The majority of homeless veterans are still post-Vietnam era. The average age has trended up a little bit to about 51 years old. We have seen some increases in returning veterans and women veterans who are homeless. Um, but you know, by and large, the numbers are going down. So 
I wanted to highlight what I, I think we see as two key drivers of those reductions. The first is our HUD-VASH program, which is a partnership between VA and HUD, uh, where HUD provides Section 8 housing choice vouchers for veterans to move into permanent housing, and those vouchers are tied to VA case management. Um, we have also implemented a housing first approach in that program, which frankly was quite a sea change for all of us in VA who are very, you know, treatment focused. We're a healthcare organization, we do treatment. Um, and so the idea of moving people right into housing and then trying to provide the wraparound services on the, on the back end was, you know, that was definitely a, a culture shift for us. Um, but we've seen that housing first works and the, Housing subsidy is vital to getting veterans housed quickly. The other key resource that's driving the numbers down is our Supportive Services for Veterans Families program. And that is a homelessness prevention, rapid rehousing program where VA provides grants to community providers to um, target very low income and uh, homeless and at-risk veterans for, uh, for short-term intervention to uh, alleviate their immediate homelessness. And we're very fortunate here in New York, we have um, eight grants spread across seven providers, about $10.4 million in that program right now here in the city. And that's, that's working well. But, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't highlight the fact that overarching these two programs are, is a really key strategy in ending veteran homelessness. And that's emphasis on community partnerships because the VA can't end homelessness alone. We are not able to serve every veteran out there um, because not everyone is eligible for our care. Um, so we really rely on our community partners to get the job done and that includes close work with agencies like Department of Homeless Services, um, our housing authorities. We have a, a whole range of nonprofit uh, community providers who we work with closely. And, you know, I think the good news is that at this point we're starting to see the tide turn where the number of veterans who are homeless is underrepresented in the homeless population. Being a veteran is becoming a protective factor rather than a risk factor. And even though I've talked a lot about programs and policy, um, really what lies behind all of this are real people who served our country, who deserve the best from us. And it's imperative that we end that cycle of despair and embrace our veterans in a continued circle of care. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Julie. Uh, our final two speakers are from the city uh, with this exciting new administration that we have. Um, first is Lorraine Stevens, who is first deputy commissioner of New York City Department of Homeless Services. Uh, Lorraine heads the, leads the agency in advancing its mission to prevent homelessness when possible and to provide short-term emergency shelter for individuals and families who have no other housing options. So I'll turn it over to Lorraine. So thank you, and I, I will try to stay within my 10 minutes. <laughs> I do have to start by saying I've only been at DHS for four weeks now. So I'm gonna ask you all to bear with me. I come to you from ACS, 22 years of experience in child welfare and advocacy, and then work for a non-for-profit that actually ran homeless shelters and uh, work with the DD population. And so what I hope to do today is just really outline our plan on how we're moving this work forward. But I wanna start by saying, we realize that DHS, you know, it requires us to kind of look at this problem, this citywide problem with compassion, collaboration, and transparency. We have to start talking about the numbers. We have to start talking about 85 families every night coming in with all of their belongings seeking shelter. This is a citywide problem. It's not a DHS problem, it's a citywide problem and we need to start addressing it. I think one of the, also one of the changes in policies is we realize that we have to work with our communities and our advocates, our non-for-profit providers, and talk to each other about how do we move this work forward. We have to work with each other, our sister agencies, NYCHA, HRA, DOE, ACS, 
These are all the city agencies that are feeding families into the homeless shelter. What is happening? How are we failing these families where they're ending up in shelter? And so our commissioner, Commissioner Taylor, actually spoke to city council on May 19th and started to outline what our plan is. And it's a preliminary plan. It's still cooking, right? It's still in the pot cooking. And there's a lot of feedback that we're getting that's helpful to us in moving this process forward. But today, I just wanted to share with you some key points of the plan that we believe will help us at least begin to start tackling this problem of homelessness and finding shelter for family. So first of all, the plan includes prevention efforts, right? It's, it's moving us forward to create the largest, most proven prevention program in, in the nation, our home-based program, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The plan also proposes two rent subsidy um, plans, and I'll talk a little bit, bit about that. Targeting supports for high needs population. And last but not least, that when we have to provide shelter, that we're providing quality services, that our children and our families and our adults feel safe in shelters. And how do we go about doing that? So first, let me talk a little bit about the increase in prevention services. Um, like I stated, we're going to be expanding the home-based home base preventive program. It's a neighborhood-based service program. It's going to be in each borough. We're actually investing an additional $12 million in this service. It's an anti-eviction program that works directly in communities where there's large number of homeless families coming into shelter. So homeless families will have an opportunity to go to these sites and seek um, help. We are hoping that this will actually be able to service about 10,000 households annually. And we're increasing it from 14 locations to an additional nine locations will be throughout New York City. Um, also, in the next few months, you'll see subway ads, PSAs, actually reaching out to the communities to let them know about home base. What is home base? How can you attach families to this service? How can you do referrals and so forth? We'll be reaching out to NYCHA, DOE, ACS. We've started those communications because what we realize is that 40% of our population have an ACS actual um, case. Many of them are on public assistance almost. I think it was like 70% of the families are on public assistance. And so we know the families that are at risk, but why aren't we sharing that information? Why aren't we attaching them to home bases? HRA has a program called FEPS. It's an anti-eviction preventive program. We're going to be expanding that program and working closely with HRA on expansion of the FEPS program. Bear with me. In terms of the two rental subsidy programs, there's two that we're actually looking at. We're looking at one for vulnerable families and working families. Um, the program, these two programs will cost the city $130 million and will serve thousands of families in the next five years. And I saw the five minute thing and I might, my talking points that my staff gave me is about seven pages, so that's why I'm trying to make sure I get on all the key points. Um, we will also continue our commitment to New York, New York 3. For those that don't know about New York, New York 3, that's a supportive housing model um, for at-risk populations. Um, and we're going to create about 9,000 units that will serve people at risk for becoming homeless. Um, at every unit, the supporting housing will save the city about 10,000 per year in public resources, such as shelter, emergency room, jails, and psychiatric facilities. When I talked a little bit about quality of service care, right now we have what we have is 3,000 cluster apartments. What that is is DHS is actually paying for homeless families to stay in apartments. Some of these apartments are in units where there are other affordable housing units. Um, the quality at times is questionable. We're in the process of right now going out to all 3,000 units and doing an evaluation of whether it's safe, a safe environment for our families. We're also investing $8 million in safety related issues around shelter, security, um, support in the different DHS run shelters as well as provider owned shelters. We're tripling our outreach on trains and subways. Um, and working closely with the MTA to actually provide services and support in the subways to 468 subway stations. So we'll be going out and working closely with MTA on identifying those on the subway in the evenings that are at risk 
and bringing them into shelter to provide them support. I talked a little bit about the agency task force. That is actually going to be facilitated by our Deputy Mayor of Health and Human Resources. She's bringing all of the Health and Human Resources agencies together to talk about how we can address this homeless population. How can we talk together? How can we work on strategies and policies in order to move this forward? And I'm, I'm probably going too fast and I'm missing something. <laughs> um, and so, I, you know, I just want to say, I think in closing that this administration is really looking at how we're spending our money. Um, DHS has a $1 billion budget. And part of it has been given to providers slash landlords who have provided housing for um, people who are homeless. And we started to ask ourselves simple questions. Can we do this work differently, right? Can we provide support differently? Um, can we use some of that funding you know, to create rental assistance for families to be able to sustain themselves. But recognizing that just providing them a home is not enough, right? There needs to be preventive services in the community, and there also needs to be aftercare support. Because providing a subsidy is not just going to prevent homelessness. We find that um, the last subsidy program, 50% of those families came back into shelter, which caused part of why our numbers are so high. And so providing that aftercare support will help to move this forward. And the mayor is fully committed into doing that. So thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, our last speaker today, and Ben, I'm pleased to say you can have your full 10 minutes. Oh, well, OK. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. He was very saying he would give up some minutes. <laughs> Uh, Benjamin Charvat is Research Director at the New York City Center for Innovation through Data Intelligence. I'm also pleased to say Dr. Charvat is a senior researcher and uh, teaches research for us at the Silver School of Social Work. So, thanks, Ben. Thank you very much, Deborah, and um, thank you very much, McSilver Institute, for the invitation to sit on this very distinguished panel, and actually, even more importantly, to talk to a distinguished audience. Typically, when I'm talking about data, uh, and I talk about the significant results of what I found, my questions are, well, how did you model the data? It wasn't actually the result and the social implication of the data and the result. So it's nice to work with advocates and to talk about some stuff that we're doing. I'll start off a little bit by talking about the um, Center for Innovation through Data Intelligence. Intelligence, it's uh, relatively new, starting in 2011. We're housed in the uh, office of the mayor. And we report directly to the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services. And what makes us very unique is that we have access to all of the health and human service data, or quite a bit of the data. So typically, what happens um, when you sh share data amongst each other is you get the lawyers involved. And if there's a lawyer in the audience, I'm very sorry. <laughs> but to try to avoid the lawyers, we have actually have a, a transfer protocol, so we're actually able to get the data as we need it as products are approved. And that makes it a very interesting way for us to take data from, for instance, DHS and match it with ACS, then match it with corrections and match it with HRA and get a much more fuller and robust picture of what's happening. Typically what happens in agencies, and this is nothing against an agency, is that they're very concerned about what happens within agency and once that person leaves their purview, they don't know where they go. Or if they do know where they go, it's no longer their problem if they were there. This is a way to connect all the services together and really make a, a, a concerted effort to provide the best quality services possible to A, make sure that cycle of service use, which obviously isn't working, stops, but we can actually implement services that are helpful and meaningful at the right time or in a timely manner. So one of the projects that we're working with at the moment, and we've actually almost completed, is we've um, partnered with Good Shepherd Services, which is a nonprofit child welfare um, provider in the city, which I think many of you know and they run something called the Chelsea Foyer at the Christopher, which is a supporting housing unit for 18 to 25 year olds. And it's a very interesting model. It comes from the UK and it's very work focused. It's for 40 youth actually. And there are multiple referral sites. So it's not pigeonholed into one referral type, if you will. So there are kids who come from DHS. There are kids who come from DYCD or Department of um, Youth and Community Development. There are kids who were formerly homeless and come on their own through referral, and there are also those who age out of foster care or in the midst of aging out of foster care. So there's a mix. 
And that's an important little element to tell you about because the mix makes funding this very difficult because nobody actually wants to fund it because it doesn't fit into like a little hole or a box. So trying to get the funding is um, always very problematic. So what um, Sister Paulette, who I think many of you know, who's the Executive Director of Good Shepherd Services, requested of us is actually to do something that we, I have never seen, which I think is very exciting and revolutionary, is we actually took nonprofit data and married it with city data to leverage the power of the data that we have to look and see not only how did they do when they're in the program, but what happened after they left the program? What city services did they actually access? And so we, actually, so we had a total of uh, 297 um, individuals in our, uh, in our sample, of which 138 were actually those who went through the Foyer program. And one of the things that we found is it was very difficult for us because we have what we call big data, so we have lots of it floating around in the agencies. And a nonprofit thinks, well, 138 kids, that's a lot of kids. Well, actually it isn't statistically and otherwise it's not enough of, for us to deal with to make things meaningful. So we had to play around a little bit with trying different ways to statistically work and find it, um, significance out of it. And what we actually decided to do, in fact, um, Deputy Commissioner Stevens mentioned, is we used um, New York, New York 3, population I, and those are the, um, specifically for children who are aging out of foster care for supportive housing. So we took those children who were approved for supportive housing but never placed as our comparison group. So we built a comparison group to really make a, a full evaluation. And so we looked at the, those two groups, our treatment and our comparison group. We looked two years before the beginning of treatment just to make sure they're the same because in research you want to make sure your groups are the same, otherwise you won't be able to isolate the treatment effect. So happily, they were the same. And then we looked at them two years, because you're able to be at the um, Chelsea Foyer at the Christopher, two years maximum. We looked at during the two year period for both groups. And when I say we're looking at, we looked at DHS and we looked at HRA and DOC. So we looked at those that level data. And then we looked one year out because that was the extent of our data. So that this went from 2006 to 2012 and then up to 13 for one year. And what we actually were able to find is that the foyer group um, were 35% less likely to have a single adult shelter stay while they're in the program compared to the comparison group. And also we were able to find that the foyer participants during the treatment time were 55% less likely to have a jail stay than their comparison group. And that's really powerful information. And the reason this is really exciting for me and I think exciting for all of us in the room is that not only can we show that something works, it's one thing to have things in place, we want to make sure they actually work, but also for funding purposes now, Sister Paula can go, well, see, it works. Look, how, look, look at the numbers, these are hard numbers. You can't say no to me. Well, they can, but we'll try not to. <laughs> um, when we did the one-year follow-up, um, we didn't find anything statistically significantly different, and I think that was more to do with the fact there was only one year as opposed to a two-year period or more. And also because of the ages of the youth that we were uh, working with, 18 to 25, they don't actually access services as much as, for instance, an adult would. So we may not actually see that kind of activity at that age range. Um, but I really think it's very exciting that what we've done with um, the Chelsea Foyer to Christopher, we're also looking to, which is a brand new thing for us in New York State, to actually ac access wage data from New York um, State Department of Labor and they'll actually give us data to actually find out what wages are they getting by quarter and what sector are they working in. So as opposed to the outcomes I just mentioned to you, home, shelter, and jail, which are obviously negative, uh, we don't want it to happen, but it's what we have available to us. How much money they make and where they're working in terms of sector is really a positive outcome to see how well it, it's going on. I do want to make one plug for the, um, the Chelsea Foyer at the Christopher. When you actually stay there in the apartment, you have to pay 30% of your salary for rent. And this is actually a very important part, and it's um, important for multiple reasons. One is to learn the ability to maintain your finances. Second of all, when you, a young person leaves that program after two years, all of that rent money is given to that young person. <laughs> and so that young person actually can afford a down payment on an apartment. And of course, we all know New York is expensive, or at least I do. Um, and I think giving a young person that ability to actually get an apartment and actually be able to put that down payment down is really a, a revolutionary idea. Um, just one last thing, I, I, I want to embarrass my staff that are here. So they're over there in the corner hiding. 
<laughs> and actually, Jessica Rathel, um, who's actually sitting over there, is the lead analyst for the, Chel the uh, Chelsea Foyer to Christopher. So thank you, Jessica. Uh, Jessica just graduated from NYU. <laughs> And we have, we have um, two interns for the summer. They're both called Rachel, because we only hire interns with the same name, <laughs> so we don't get confused. Rachel and Rachel over there. <laughs> and one last plug I did want to make. I think you showed me something over there, so I'll make it quick. Um, we're also starting to work with um, Community Solutions and the uh, uh, Brownsville Partnership. And they work specifically, it's an ev eviction prevention program in NYCHA housing and we're doing something similar to evaluate the impact of those services for families who actually are in the eviction process. So I think it's really exciting, and I think um, it's, it's a way that especially, well, it's a way, for instance, the CIDI, our uh, vision is to make data come alive to inspire change. And I think that's what we really want, and I think collectively from this panel that we want all of our young people and old people like me um, to not only be, um, an active member of society, but actually more importantly to be a valued member of society. So thank you very much.